the talk will be about the new master paradigm which has taken over uh, the sciences and the world at large over the last few decades. Uh, the master paradigm for understanding what's happening in the world, what's happening in the world outside us, and what's, ha what's happening in the world between us in society, and what's happening in the world inside us, inside our bodies and brains and minds. And this master, new master paradigm is uh, information processing. More and more disciplines in, uh, in the uh, natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities uh, take information process processing as the basic model for understanding how the body works, how economics works, how the mind works. And this has a positive side because it enabled many new scientific breakthroughs in individual disciplines. And it also has uh, another huge advantage <coughs> that it enables easier synergy between different disciplines, easier communications, uh, easier uh, way to understand each other, biologists and economists understand each other better now because they, more, they, they both speak more and more the language of data processing and not employing different mutually difficult to understand uh, paradigms. There is however a danger uh, in one paradigm overtaking not only a single discipline but uh, all the disciplines or most of the disciplines and this is that we become more and more blind to whatever this particular paradigm has difficulty explaining or has even difficulty describing and understanding. So I will try to speak about both sides uh, of this, uh, of the rise of information processing as the new master paradigm, both how it is taking over the various disciplines and the new ideas it generated and the danger that are inherent in this situation. Uh, so let's begin with the life sciences. In the life sciences, it, over the last few uh, decades, it has become increasingly accepted to view life and living beings, organisms, as, uh, as, a, as data processing machines. An organism is more and more understood as a self-replicating machine for processing information. Uh, giraffes or dolphins or tomatoes are just different kinds of machines for processing data. The machines, that, the, the, the common thread that unites them is that they are not only able to process data, they are also able to replicate themselves. And life itself is increasingly understood as the process of accumulating, analyzing, and disseminating <coughs> information. And this is most notable in the way that uh, sensations, emotions, and thoughts are treated they are increasingly seen sensations like pain or emotions like love and fear and courage they are increasingly seen as complex neurobiological algorithms for processing data about the world and about the organism itself so I'll just give two, uh, two examples of uh, what it means to see sensations and emotions as neurobiological algorithms so let's take uh, fear and courage as an example. Let's take a simple situation. You have a monkey who sees a bunch of bananas on a tree, but he also sees that there is a lion crawling nearby, and there is a chance that if the monkey uh, goes ahead and tries to grab the bananas, the lion will grab the monkey. And the monkey has, this is a problem in information processing, and in decision making, what decision the monkey will make. So the monkey doesn't take out, out pen and paper and start doing calculations, and it doesn't use a computer. The monkey's body and the monkey's brain are seen as a machine for taking in all the various bits of relevant data, processing them, and coming up with a decision, with, with a solution, which will manifest itself as a feeling as an emotion and as a sensation, you have to take into account, in, even though this is quite a simple uh, problem, you have to take into account lots of data. The monkey has to take into account, for instance, data from within about his current energy level, whether he's very hungry or not, whether the body needs a lot of energy, other, if, if he may be on the, on the brink of dying from starvation, or he may be glutted 
from having eaten too many bananas over the, over the last few hours. So this should be taken into account. The more energy the monkey needs, the more attractive the bananas would look. He also has to take into account how much energy is there in the bananas. If it's just two small unripe bananas, it's a different situation than if it is a huge bunch of bananas, big and ripe. The monkey has to take into account also his physical condition, how fast he can run. And he has to take into account data from the outside world about the lion, how far is the lion, very far or quite close to the tree with the banana. <coughs> he has to take into account the situation of the lion. Is he sleeping? Is he awake? Is he big? Is he small? Does he look hungry? Does he look satiated? So he has to take into account all these bits of data, process them, and come out with a solution. And this is done by the body and the brain and the nervous system. You have a neurobiological algorithm which takes these pieces of data in, makes the calculation, and the whole process and the uh, end result will manifest themselves as sensations and emotions within the monkey. For instance, it may result in an emotion of fear. If the bananas are far away, the lion is hungry and fast, the monkey feels tired, he will be fearful, he wouldn't like to, he wouldn't try to, to get the bananas. If the lion is far away and asleep, the bananas are very tempting, the monkey may become full of courage, I feel I can do it, and run and try to grab the bananas. So the monkey wouldn't know that this is a neurobiological algorithm. As far as he is concerned, this is sensations and emotions. But one of the big breakthroughs, one of the big revolutions in the life sciences over the last few uh, decades is exactly the way that we more and more treat, analyze, see, sensations and emotions as just part of an algorithm for making calculations, neurobiological calculations. The same is true for emotions or feelings uh, regarding <coughs> things like beauty or ugliness and sexual attraction. Today it is customary to understand beauty as, again, an evolutionary or neurobiological algorithm and not for survival, but for reproduction. If the previous example with the bananas is about algorithms for survival, then beauty and sexual attraction is about algorithms uh, for reproduction. Somebody beautiful, somebody attractive, the meaning of this today, as we understand it today, is here is a good chance for reproduction. Beauty means fertility, beauty means health, beauty means fit genes. It's not and uh, society that educates us to see this as beautiful, but it is evolution, the genes which educate us or force us to see it as beautiful, because these are the basic algorithms that make living, creature, uh, living creatures function. Oh, I forgot to show the picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have two computers with different things. So, uh, what is beautiful, either in the case of human beings, or in the case of peacocks, it's basically, it's not out there in the world, it's not in the eye of the beholder beauty, beauty is in the calculations of, of evolution. Be beautiful, somebody beautiful, is somebody who the statistics of evolution indicate that this is a good chance for reproduction. So this is the, what is happening in the life sciences. Understanding life, living organisms, emotions, sensations as just parts of a big machine for calculating bits of data in order to uh, survive and to reproduce. The same thing is, it, it started I think, I'm not sure when it started, this, this idea of information processing, maybe in computer sciences, but it's slowly spread first to the life sciences and over the last 20, 30 years, more and more, also into the social sciences, for instance, economics. More and more economists are understanding the economy as like a living organism, is actually a machine for processing data, so also the economy and the market are just mechanisms that the main thing they do is not to produce things, but to uh, make calculations, to process uh, information. 
For instance, if we take the largest, the, most, two, the two most important uh, economic theories or economic uh, uh, worldviews of the last century, capitalism and communism, then today it is increasingly common to understand the difference between capitalism and communism, not in ideological, ter ideological terms, but in terms of data processing. Communism and capitalism are different systems for processing data and reaching uh, decisions and conclusions in the economic field. Communism is a system, is a hierarchical and centralized system of uh, data processing. There is a central politburo in Moscow or in Beijing and it controls the entire economy. Uh, factories and, cons and different factories and factories and customers are not connected directly one to the other. The factory owner does not respond to the wishes of potential consumers. He responds to orders coming from Moscow or from whatever, wherever the Politburo uh, uh, sits. And similarly, similarly, the consumers, they consume basically whatever the central authority the central, <coughs> central processing unit tells them or enables them to consume. So you have a model of information processing in which there is a single central processing unit and everything flows, all the information flows to them hierarchically and then decisions and orders are coming back from the top, from the center to uh, all the uh, lower, lower and lower in the hierarchy. Capitalism on the other hand, is a system for processing data which is far less hierarchical and far less centralized. At the center of the capitalism stands the market, not the Politburo. And the market, again, is seen as a place where information is exchanged and analyzed and processed. In the capitalist model, the factory speaks directly with the consumers. They exchange information about what the consumer wants, what the uh, 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 manufacturer can or cannot uh, produce, and this is how it works. Um, a few days ago, Margaret Thatcher uh, passed away, one of the architects of the victory of capitalism over communism. In the late 1980s, uh, as the Soviet Union was collapsing, and realizing that the communist system of central information processing is doomed. So experts from the Soviet Union went to the uh, uh, temples of capitalism in London, in New York, in Washington to understand how, how a capitalist economy functions. What is the alternative for the centralized uh, data processing system? So there is a story about an uh, expert from the Soviet Union in the late 1980s coming to London uh, to Margaret Thatcher's capital to understand how a market economy, capitalist market economy functions. And they take him, the British guides, take him on a tour of London to see how it functions. And he was amazed, one of the things that amazed him, that he saw many bakeries. And in none of the bakeries, there was no queues. <coughs> Back home, in Moscow, in Leningrad, uh, every bakery is such a long queue. And here in London, no queues. So he told the, the guys, the British guys, please take me to the man, or to the woman, in charge of providing bread for London. I want to understand how they are so efficient in providing bread for millions of people in London without this central system of, of command of, of the party. And then the British uh, guys were scratching their heads and they realized nobody, there is nobody who is in charge of providing bread for London. There is no central office who is responsible for providing bread for London. So how come London doesn't starve if nobody is in charge? Because the market is in charge. There is a free market in which the main, the most important thing which is exchanged in the free market is not, uh, is not stuff, is not bread and shoes and shirts and so forth, it's information. The secret of success, the secret of victory of capitalism over communism, at least according to current theories, is that it is much more efficient in uh, trying transmitting, accepting and analyzing uh, information and therefore it manages to react
far more flexibly and far more quickly to the economic developments than the stultified, the rigid system of, uh, of communism. So this is why communism collapsed. Not because it's evil empire or something, because it was inefficient in processing data, or at least less efficient in processing information than uh, the uh, capitalist adversary. Uh, the same ideas are taking hold also in departments of political science. And politics too is understood more and more in terms of different ways of analyzing, processing information. Governments and parliaments, what's, happen what ha what's happening there? The same thing which is happening in markets, the same thing which is happening within living organisms in the nervous system, data is being accumulated and uh, uh, processed. And again, if you have different political systems, what you really need to understand, according to the new thinking, is not things like human rights and legal theories and things like that, forget about all that. The real difference between different political systems is the way in which they process information. Again, taking democracy versus uh, dictatorships, it's a bit similar to what we saw in the economic field in the relations between co communism and uh, capitalism. Democracy functions on the, uh, the basic idea of, of democracy in terms of data processing is to have many independent processors with freedom of communications between them. The basic idea of dictatorship is having a central processing unit and all communication must go through the central processing unit, unit and as little as possible freedom of communication is allowed between the other parts of the system. And again, the, the current thinking today, current wisdom today says why did democracy win in the long run over dictatorships in the 20th century, not because human rights or liberal values are so good, but because democracies, in the long run, know how to process data, information, far more efficiently. In the short run, there are sometimes occasions in which a single dictator ordering everybody around say in a, in a big crisis, in a war, this can be more efficient. It saves a lot of time, a lot of noise in the system. But in the long run, it will fail, because it is far less, fle far less uh, uh, flexible. Now, not everybody agrees on it. Today there is a big discussion, for example, about the Chinese model versus the American model. Both in politics and economics are very clo closely, closely related to one another. And there are heretical voices saying, look at China, maybe after all, liberal democracy is not the most efficient way to uh, process information, and if so, then maybe the Chinese uh, model will, uh, will take the lead <coughs> in the 21st uh, century. So this is what's happening in various social sciences. It's, uh, it is also coming increasingly to the humanities. Uh, in my own field of history, there is also a growing tendency, of, really for the last decade or so, to see history too as being moved by the mechanisms, <coughs> by the logic of data processing, what is the optimal data processing system according to uh, common thinking? If you want to have the optimal, the best, most efficient uh, data processing system, what do you have to do? You have to maximize the number of processors in the system, more processors, the better. You have to increase, maximize the number of connections between the processors. A system with relatively few processors, but many connections, will be superior to a system with more processors, but they are not connected to one another, so they can't, uh, uh, there is no synergy. And it's not enough to have connections. You have to have freedom of movement along these connections between the processors, otherwise the connections are, are worthless. To have a connection, say a cable connecting two computers, but there is a blockage in the middle, it doesn't do, do anybody any good. So this is idea from information processing uh, theory. Now, it is increasingly common to see history as uh, the entire, the whole of human history, at least 
in the last few centuries as a process of producing the ultimate data processing system. Look at the last 500 years through the eyeglasses of data processing theory. What you've seen is first of all over the last 500 years all over, all over the world a rise, an exponential rise in the number of processors. The, you, if, you, if you understand the whole of humankind, not individual humans, but the whole of humankind, try to visualize it, try to understand the whole of humankind as a big mechanism for data processing in which each person, each individual is a single processor. Processor. So over the last 500 years, what you see is an exponential rise in the number of processors in the system. First, there is a rise in the number of people, from about 500 million in the year 1500 to more than 7 billion today. So you have many more processors in the system, and increasingly you have non-human processors uh, being co-opted into the system, mainly a computer. Computers. The second major uh, trend, major development of human history over the last 500 years is that not only there are many more processors, there are many more connections between, between them. Imperialism, trade relations, the development of transport and communication infrastructures. Look at them through the glass, through the glasses of data processing theory and what we actually see is more and more connections between the processors. When Columbus lands in 1492 in, the, in, in America, what, what's really happening is that two big processing units, the old world and the new world, which previously were disconnected from one another, become connected. And this is the most important thing that is happening. Everything else, Christianity, uh, slavery, and so forth, this is, this is side issues. From, through, the, uh, through the glasses of data processing theory, what's really happening is that more and more processors are being linked into a single system. And then there is the third, uh, the, the third major development of the last 500 years, maximizing the freedom of information to move along these connections. It is not enough to forge trade relations. It is not enough to conquer new colonies and connect them to the mother country. It is not enough to move populations from here to there. If there is no freedom of information to move along these connections, we didn't really achieve much. And indeed, what you see along the last 500 years, not in a straight line, it's not linear, there are ups and downs, but overall, there is an increase in freedom over the last 500 years. Freedom of what? Freedom of whom? Not freedom of humans, necessarily. Freedom of uh, communication, of information, moving from here to there. So again, we are used to thinking about these issues from an, uh, a traditional put the, the glasses of traditional ideologies, like liberal and humanist ideologies, that praise values like uh, freedom, like liberty, uh, human rights, due to various ideological uh, uh, reasoning. Now we can see them from a different angle, from a different light. What's really, what's really important, the, the, the reason why these values became supreme, is not because they are true. There is nothing true about human rights or a democracy or freedom of speech. The, the reason why these values triumph is because building the ultimate data processing system requires it. It requires freedom, not of people necessarily, but of information moving around. Those who gave this freedom, those who advanced this freedom, they gained because they are able to process information uh, more quickly and uh, in, in better ways. So now when we move to the field, to the realm, to the fuzzy realm of philosophy and ethics, we, we see that uh, the new ideas about data processing as the master narrative, the master paradigm, they are beginning to acquire an ethical Edge ethical implication. This has happened to many previous scientific theories, like the theory of evolution. 
that what began as a mere scientific theory to explain the world, a neutral description of what's happening in the world acquires over time ethical and political messages. Now, if life is really the flow of information, which is what this paradigm is telling us, then the sanctity of life, which is the main value, at least today in the world, when we speak about the sanctity of life, what we are actually speaking about is the sanctity of the flow of information. And this new understanding, we see it today, really over the last 10, 20 years, how, whereas 20 years ago, people spoke about the freedom of speech, now more and more people, especially the younger generation, are not speaking about the freedom of speech, they are speaking about the freedom of information. And it sounds very similar, freedom of speech and freedom of information, but it's a very big revolution. Because think, who is free when we, when, when we say these, these uh, phrases? In freedom of speech, the one who is free is the individual. I'm free to speak my mind, and I'm also free to be silent. It's up to me. Freedom of speech is also freedom of silence. I, I don't have to speak if, if I don't want to. But with freedom of information, which is the value, if you look at the last 20, 30 years, it is the value that gains in, in importance more than any other values over the last uh, uh, two, three decades. In freedom of information, freedom is given not to the person, but to the information. The information wants to be free. The information needs to be free. And we have, for example, um, an example uh, for, from the last uh, few months, maybe the first martyr of the freedom of information uh, movement, Aaron Schwartz, who committed suicide, uh, I think three or four months ago, uh, rather than facing trial by the uh, US authorities, his crime was that he broke into the academic uh, bank of articles, JSTOR, with millions of millions of articles, and uh, wanted, and in, in part did it, uh, set it free. Put the, uh, the JSTOR, uh, at least previously, demanded payment from people who wanted access, from people in institutions who wanted access to the information, to the articles, and uh, Schwartz said the information means to be free. It's a crime against the freedom of information to lock information behind barriers and demand money uh, to gain access. The information wants to be free. So he freed the information and was persecuted for it and, and paid with his life. So freedom of information rather than of persons and of speech is becoming more and more central to the ethical understanding, at least of the new gener generation, the understanding of life itself, what it means to have, to live a rich and a meaningful life, is becoming to live a life of, with more and more flow of information, a life more connected to the general network of data processing. <coughs> the meaning of life is increasingly becoming to produce and share information to produce and share songs and ideas and uh, video, video uh, uh, clips and books and articles and whatever. Everything you do, tape it. Everything you tape, put online. Everything you put online, share. Otherwise, it has not no meaning. There is no meaning to doing anything, to experiencing anything, unless it, it becomes part of the general network of data processing. And we even see today the rise of new religions. The most interesting place today for scholars of religion is not India, and it's not the Muslim world, it's California and the Silicon Valley, and not because of uh, computer scientists taking classes in yoga or meditation. Because it, it, rather it is because the rise of a new kind of religion, techno-religions, Religions at, at, its, at their core stands technology and technological innovations, but they have clearly religious visions of what to do with these technological uh, innovations. The main, uh, there are different versions of the same idea, but if you look at many of the new techno-religions, 
you see that the main theme is to upgrade Homo sapiens into a better kind, a more efficient kind of data processing mechanism, of data processing system. Like we upgrade our computers and our iPhones, why not upgrade ourselves? If life is about processing data, the more data we process and the more efficiently we do it, the more life we have. So why stay with the outdated, old-fashioned uh, mechanism that evolution shaped? Why not upgrade our own uh, data processing uh, mechanism? And one, one way of doing it is by changing the people themselves, changing Homo sapiens, upgrading Homo sapiens with all kinds of things like genetic engineering or co connecting people and computers, creating cyborgs and, and things like that. But the main goal is to have better data processing uh, system or a different, a different approach is to connect uh, all the people into a single, what's happening with, with the internet, so there are technical religions today saying, why not create the internet of all things, link all things in the world, humans and non-human things into a single uh, data processing system, and basically homo sapiens will merge into the system, will create some kind of eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent uh, consciousness, uh, cosmic consciousness, which will be the ultimate uh, data processing system and which will spread all over the universe. This sound may be fantastic and, 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 and a bit of a hallucinogenic, but there is serious research being um, financed and being advanced, inspired by such kind of thinking. Maybe later in the, in the questions and answers times we can uh, uh, speak a bit more about it. Anyway, so we see that the data processing paradigm is acquiring ethical, philosophical, religious uh, uh, components um, to experience increasingly means to more and more people to share information and experience, even a pers very personal experience has no meaning unless it is shared and become part of a bigger data processing uh, mechanism <laughs> People increasingly live as processors within bigger systems. I, I know about myself, for example, that much of my day I actually function as a processor within a larger network. I sit in front of the computer, I get fed by information coming to me, emails, telephone calls, I look up uh, articles on, on the web, I read articles and book, and then I produce information and spread it like I'm doing now, talking to you. So I'm spreading this information. You can see me as a, as a processor with information coming in, being processed, and more um, information coming out. And the system is always is relentlessly pressuring us to uh, process more and more information faster and faster. I try to answer my emails faster and faster, and the faster I do it, the faster my emails reach their destination, and somebody else now has to answer them, and they come back to me, and I have to work hard, and, and so forth and so on. It doesn't necessarily make life easier or nicer or happier, but it does make the big network far more efficient and far quicker in processing the information. And we spoke earlier about, I mentioned Margaret Thatcher and the ideas of capitalism and the, what is today called neo-capitalism or neoliberalism, seeing the market and, and the stock exchange as an information network. So the, again, the main idea is that unlike in the Soviet Union, nobody has to be in charge. Nobody has to understand what is happening. Nobody understands what's happening. There is no single person or group of persons today in the world who really understand what's happening in the world, either in the economy or in politics, but the neoliberal uh, paradigm, the neoliberal uh, orthodoxy says it doesn't matter. Nobody needs to understand what's happening in the economy. The market is thinking for us. The only thing we have to do 
is ensure the freedom of information and ensure that people share more and more information more and more quickly and the rest will be done by the invisible hand or in this case the invisible brain of the market he will, the market will know uh, what to do so even if it's and we'll speak about it in a few minutes even if it's wrong to understand life as information processing we are making it true it's also something that happens many times in history that people have an idea about how the world really functions and it's a wrong idea, it doesn't function like this but because people think it does function like this they start acting accordingly and eventually it becomes real it becomes reality so this is what is happening today with this paradigm of information processing even if it's, it's a wrong model for life and for the world it is becoming a true model because we are acting uh, according to it now the big question that arises is whether we are missing something now obviously the adoption of this model for understanding life and economics and the body and politics had huge advantages it had made immense breakthrough not just in one discipline but in many disciplines but the danger is that maybe we are missing something maybe there are parts of reality that cannot be understood in such a way especially when we are speaking about life which is the most complex uh, uh, thing we know and I want to speak about one example there are many possible examples but I want to give one example of things we don't see or choose not to see when we adopt, uh, when we adopt this particular uh, framework for understanding the world and life There used to be three big questions in, in the world, in, in philosophy, in human thought. What is the universe and how was it, and how did it appear, where did it come from? What is life and how did life appear? And finally, what is mind and how did mind appear? Now, over the last few decades, quite amazingly, we've managed more or less to solve two of these questions in a more or less satisfactory way physics has given us a pretty good account of what the universe is and how did it appear up to a fraction of a second after the Big Bang there is still this millionth of a second of the Big Bang which we can't really understand but 13 and a half billion years of, of, of subsequent uh, developments we pretty much uh, understand, at least uh, physics experts say that we pretty much understand uh, what's happening there. So we have we made a V on the first big question. Now about the second big question, this is the most surprising, many people don't realize it, I, I think in Weizmann everybody realizes it, but at least, at least in the outside world, that most people haven't realized it, but the <coughs> big riddle of life has been solved over the last uh, few decades to a large extent thanks to the uh, thinking, thanks to the breakthrough of the data processing uh, model we now understand life also pretty well as a process through which replicators replicate themselves and what are replicators? replicators are data processing systems that can make copies of themselves and we even have a pretty good account of how the first self-replicating replicator of how the first first replicating data processing system could have emerged out of uh, simpler parts none of which is a data processing uh, uh, system a replicate self-replicating data processing system but about the third big question of what, it, what is mind and how did mind appear we have made very very little progress uh, over the last uh, few decades uh, we've, and when I speak about mind and, and here we come to maybe the, the, the crux of the, of the problem when I speak of mind I speak about the subjective experience of life as against the uh, biological, the physiological aspects of life when I speak about mind, say for instance, let's take the experience of pain 
I speak about the experience, the subjective experience of feeling pain, of something is painful, not about the physiology of pain. The physiology of pain, we've made an immense advance in understanding it over the last century. But the subjective <coughs> feeling of pain, what is it exactly, what did it come from, here I would like to argue we've made far less uh, uh, advance, and we don't think about it and we don't uh, give it much, much, much attention because it doesn't have much of a place within the dominant, the new dominant paradigm of data processing. What is mind according to the data processing paradigm? It, 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 it doesn't, this paradigm doesn't ignore completely the existence of mind for the simple reason that scientists too have minds, so they know that there is something there. I mean, we can't, it's, it's an old uh, understanding of philosophers that we cannot prove the existence of mind, we cannot prove the existence of the mind of anybody else except ourselves, which we experience directly. So there is no way you can prove to a scientist, say to a neurobiologist, that there is such a thing as mind in the world. But luckily, so far, all neurobiologists, as far as we know, have minds, have subjective experiences, so they accept that there is such a thing as a subjective experience. So they have to give some account of, of what it is. And there are two main accounts of what mind is, what the subjective experience of life is. One way of accounting for it within the model of data processing is that mind, in some way or the other, the subjective experience of pain or love or hate, fulfills an, some essential part in the, uh, in the way the data is processed in the brain. There is an algorithm for processing what's happening in the world, and subjective experience is one of the cubicles within the algorithm. The other explanation of how to account for the existence of mind within the framework of the data processing model is to say, yes, there is mind, we know, but it is an inessential but unavoidable byproduct of data processing processes in the brain. It's a kind of mental pollution. There is this process going on in the brain, and what to do? Mind comes out of it, but it does nothing. It just comes out of it. So these are the two main explanations. Either it fulfills some essential part in the calculations, in the algorithms, or it doesn't do anything, it's just a pollution coming out of the, out of the process, but doing nothing. Now, the problem with these accounts is that they ignore the most unique, the most important quality of, of, of mind, of subjective experience. They ignore the subjective feel of, of the mind. And the subjective experience, I would like to argue, to try to explain it in the next few minutes, uh, uh, just the tip of the iceberg, but a few words. Mind is not about data processing. The, 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 the problem, the big problem of the data processing a model with the mind is that as far as we understand, as far as we know mind from our experience, it is not about data processing. The basic nature of mind is the experience of craving and aversion, of liking things and disliking things, not the experience of processing data. Now, the data processing model wants to give an account of liking and disliking in terms of processing information. Okay, we like and dislike, it has some function within the algorithm of processing information, but I think it misses the main, the unique nature of mind. Mind is not about analyzing reality. Mind is not about understanding reality. The main thing that mind does, subjective experiences do, is to color it reality. It adds something which is not there to reality. It paints reality in very sharp and very, very vivid colors that weren't there when just the bits of information are taken together. And now, <clears throat> we understand perfectly well how, uh, almost perfectly well, how a pattern of electric currents and biochemical processes in the brain can process information. We know how 
uh, again, we know how uh, a pattern of electric charges and, and action in the brain can process information. But so far, as, at least as far as I know, I would love to, to hear uh, uh, theories about it, but as far as I know, nobody has even a shred of an explanation how a pattern of electric currents and biochemical reactions in the brain can produce a subjective experience of pain or of love or of hate. Now, what we try to do is to reduce pain and love and hate and so forth into an algorithm for processing data, but in doing so, we strip the subjective experience of its most essential and unique quality, and instead focus on the objective, the calculable uh, manifestations of this phenomenon. And thereby, we, we don't notice our own ignorance. I mean, we focus on what we know to do well, and we try to avoid discussing what we don't understand. For instance, say, publishing an article. If you want to publish an article in the journal Nature or Science, it is impossible to explain in an article, in a journal like Nature or Science, what is the subjective feeling of pain. Somebody who has never experienced pain will never understand the subjective feeling of pain from reading an article in Science trying to explain it. So we don't write such articles, because it is impossible. Instead, what we do is to write articles explaining the objective qualities of the physiology of pain. For instance, we say that we try to give an account how many bits of information are moving from which part of the hand to which part of the brain, how fast they are moving, what are the results once these bits of information reach the brain, and so forth. So we know an awful lot about the physiology of pain, but not about the subjective feeling of pain. Or we can ask people and do statistics about the way people describe pain. For instance, we can write an article showing that from a sample of 350 people, 84.5 reported that taking, taking a particular medicine has reduced 